Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really excited to have you all with us. And we are gonna be having a webinar today on peer mentoring and uh, peer mental health. The webinar today is being recorded and all of the materials will be shared with you um, afterwards. They'll be available on our website and they will be emailed out. Um, this webinar is being um, put on by the California School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, we believe that healthcare should be where schools are, uh, where kids are in schools and accessible and not create a barrier to learning. Um, we have a membership and if you uh, become a member, you get conference discount tools and resources, technical assistance, and, and it helps us put on webinars and trainings like today. So we're really uh, grateful to have three amazing presenters with us today. Um, oops, go back. Lost my slide. We have uh, Bianca um, from uh, OUSD, and she is um, a work-based learning liaison at Madison Park Academy in East Oakland. Her work focuses on creating culturally responsive, equitable, and empowering systems and opportunities for youth to engage in meaningful work experience and career readiness. We have Robin Morales, and she's worked in the service of youth, families, and underserved communities for over two decades. Her focus has been to build and grow models for young people to become empowered as the experts of their own experience and create change in their environments. Currently, Robin is coordinating and building a systems of care for Madison Park Academy Middle and High School in East Oakland as a school-based clinical consultant with Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency, Center for Healthy Schools and Community. And we also have Becca Prager, um, and she's a school-based clinical manager for the Alameda County Center for Healthy Schools and Communities. She's been working closely with youth and their families for over 25 years and believes in using social work services as a tool for social justice. So these um, presenters are really wonderful. They're gonna go through um, what their work has been. And I just wanna also put out there that we're really hoping um, that you get a lot out of this. And if there's um, any of you out there who really wanna dive deeper into this work, um, they're gonna be available afterwards to help support in coaching and mentoring and how to actually put this program um, into place at your site. Uh, and at the end, there will be an evaluation and I hope that you um, take some time to fill that out. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to them. Cool, I can start sharing my screen. Bianca and I are um, <clears throat> at a school site. So I, we, I just unmuted because the loudspeaker was on like, like in the olden days when you have <laughs> announcements coming through the loudspeaker. Um, welcome everyone. We are so excited to be with you all. Um, it's really an honor and thank you to Jessica for inviting us. Um, I have been explaining to people what this means to me, but really um, the, um, the school-based alliance folks like that, like the conferences that got put on and being in community with you all um, when we were live and together um, over the years has really been a place of a lot of um, learning and growth and, and really being in with some really smart, great people um, who are really doing the work. And, and it's always really been um, an honor to be with you all. And um, so I'm feeling that now. Um, I feel, you know, very humbled to be with you um, as we're gonna take you through um, what we've been working on and doing for some time now. So um, Becca or Bianca, do you wanna say anything as we begin? I can just introduce myself. My name is Bianca. I'm a work-based learning liaison at Madison Park in East Oakland. It's a really fancy job title for basically saying I do jobs and internships for kids. So I run our summer internship program. I help with our college classes, kids accessing dual enrollment courses so they can get ahead. I help with all of the college applications, anything that helps you figure out what you wanna do with your life while you're in high school, that kind of falls under my umbrella. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Becca Prager, and I work with uh, Alameda County Center for Healthy Schools and Communities, and after years of direct service, I'm now more in supervision and management, so I get to support staff in our, in our schools in Oakland and Hayward, and so I've gotten to link with this amazing program through supporting uh, Robin and Bianca. 
And Jessica kind of, I mean, she did a great job and read our bios. And I think for me um, in the introduction, I just want to say I've been supporting the school um, here in deep East Oakland in Sobrani Park, Madison Park Academy, um, with the support of Becca and Bianca really le le legitimizing and dialing into what has been um, basically a tier one level service that has just continued to grow. It's six years now um, of us delivering um, a peer-to-peer -peer based model um, for kids to be able to learn to take care of each other and do that in a really um, healthy and collaborative way with caring adults. So we're super, super excited to share our work with you all. Um, so our objectives for today, Bianca put this beautiful coup libre in there for us to um, be able to think about too. Um, our objectives is to um, for you all to be able to experience a frame for youth development where young people are leading as the experts of their own experience. So in at our site, um, which is a middle and a high school, that means that high school students are, are looking back at what it was like for them to be a sixth grader, a seventh grader, a middle school person moving through that time in their lives and leading with that experience on what will work best for talking to a young person um, every day or every week, right? So that you then you all are able to leave inspired um, by hopefully being able to see what we've done and have some tools to be able to continue to do some peer-based work um, at your own site that supports the needs of your young people that you're serving. Um, our agenda will take you through a frame um, on how we got here and then what we made, um, how we did it, which is then the curriculum, which you'll receive in all different sorts of ways. We'll put it in the chat while we're talking. Um, you'll get the data of what we've learned over six years. Um, I, I added them all up. It's about over 500 kids that have been through the program in some type of way over this, this time. And um, again, continuing to share out the tools and resources that we have. We're gonna move pretty quickly so that we can leave some time for questions so that if we leave things out, just take some notes. Um, Jessica's in the chat, so you can also put some stuff in there um, if we are not answering questions and, and getting to the things that you're really curious about. We want to make sure that we're really serving you during our time. Great. So we're going to take um, a few moments to frame how did MPA mentoring come to be? So the Center for Healthy Schools and Communities is uh, maybe one slide back. Bianca, we can kind of, with our, our beautiful young people. Um, the Center for Healthy Schools and Communities is a department held within the Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency. Our mission is to foster the academic success, health, and well being of all students. We work in partnership with school districts, community based organizations, and school sites to provide and fund services for youth and families. One of our strategies is to place our staff in Title I schools to assess the behavioral health needs of that particular site and to provide support and consultation as needed. The MPA mentoring program was born from this partnership between our staff, Robin Morales and Madison Park Academy in East Oakland's Sobrani Park neighborhood. Next slide, Bianca. Thank you. So to develop, to develop any program, it's critical to understand the community we are serving. MPA is located in Sobrani Park, which is a small East Oakland community that is rich in cultural diversity, close-knit families, and community support. Sobrani is historically challenged by violence, poverty, and systemic racism. There are high rates of trauma. And Sobrani is one of the four uh, top highest impacted zip codes during the pandemic with high rates of job loss, food insecurity, and COVID. MPA is an Oakland Unified Title I school. It is based on a community school model with Native American Health Clinic on site. It's unique in that we have both middle and high school on campus, uh, sixth through 12th grade. Uh, thank you. Yes, Title I, 100% in reduced lunch. We have 700 students with a rapidly increasing number of students termed newcomer students who have come to the United States very recently. MPA is home to 100% students of color and the majority of students speak a language other than English at home. 
also nearly 100% of the teachers are not from this community or the same background as our students. And all of these demographics are deeply important in the ongoing design of our mentoring program. So the coordination of service team or cost is the system used by Oakland Unified and our center to gather referrals, identify student need and strategize supports. When Robin landed in MPA, she coordinated the cost meetings for the middle and high school and realized that given the immense number of referrals, um, there was a need to create an innovative school-wide approach to support. So this slide is left over from when um, Bianca and Becca did this presentation. Um, without me and um, it's really sort of sweet to see the founder title, but um, a guiding question in general, and if you all are familiar with um, Into Kimberg and solution focused therapy is what would it look like if everything was going well, right? So um, at a school site where um, you're the clinician on site to consult about um, what do kids need and how to deliver that, um, we're really always just sort of tasked with the problem, right? Like with, you know, like what is, um, what is the need? Um, who um, is in need of services? And it's all very problem focused and in solution focused, it's like, let's start to envision what would it look like if it was everything was going well? What it, would it look like if people were really getting what they needed? Um, we see this in terms of like trauma informed work, right? When we start to talk about the resiliency building, resiliency um, and Bianca, we can keep moving. Um, so, what the premise is and what mentoring really comes out of is a model that was actually created um, in um, through Youth, Youth Justice Institute um, where, um, sorry, where um, college students would go into custody in, ju in juvenile hall in San Francisco and interview kids. And in that system, um, very much kids have been caught doing something wrong. And um, in coming from that work in that frame and moving into schools, for me, I was like, it really is going to be our job to create spaces where people are doing right and where we're calling them out for that. Um, what I learned in my time work, working with kids who um, were system involved and incarcerated is that young people, especially, I mean, all of us are going to be good at whatever we're, to we're told that we are, right? So if you're repeatedly told that you're bad, and if you happen to identify as male, um, you identify as being um, African American or black or brown, um, and you are told that you are dangerous and that you are bad, you will get good at that. It will be your job. You will be good at doing that. And you might even get a good outfit going on to go along with it and whatnot, but like you're going to become good at it. Um, as a culture, we receive attention when something isn't working and when we're doing something wrong. For, us, for those of us that are in schools, when you go into a classroom and you say someone's name, they're like, what's the problem? They are assuming that there's something wrong. We don't hear our name unless there is a problem attached to it. Um, so we're working, and this this program is making um, opportunities for 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 us for us all to be celebrated, acknowledged, seen, and heard, and consistently. So really, with mentoring, it is so so simple. It's a high school student is going in to meet with a middle school student on a regular basis. There's a schedule for this. It's going to be every Tuesday and I'm gonna come to second period and I'm gonna pull you out of class and I'm gonna say your name and it's not because you're in trouble. And we're gonna hear your name out loud and it's because I'm here to meet with you for us to color or draw, play Uno, kick a ball. And I'm gonna check in with you and see how you're doing. And it's gonna, it's, it's good. And mentoring is a place and space, the space that I'm in right now, um, continuing to try to create spaces and time to be able to catch people being themselves, being 
lovable, smart, kind, creative, resourceful. And if you're having a meltdown, that just means that you're having a bad day. It does not mean there's something wrong with you, that you matter, that you're important, that you deserve to get your needs met, that if you have a question, you have a need, that we are here for that that we're taking time not to just ask how it's going, but also to listen to the answer and stop and really reflect on what might be needed. And we're gonna cover with you the clinical framework in which that's being done also where adults are not asking for high school students to come in and do their jobs for them essentially, um, but that we are um, setting up a scaffold for high school students to be able to be supported, to be able to be there for the middle school folks. In other sites, this may look different. It may be different types of pairings and parameters that go around that. But when we are reflecting goodness, we get more. We just do. And so what we've seen over the five years is that this number just continues to increase. Um, 14 high school students met with 28 middle school students in the first year. Um, our last year when we were open for business and serving folks was two classrooms full of high school students. Um, I think it was up to like 57 high school students and they were serving up to I think 90 plus um, middle school students. So this number exponentially keeps growing. Kids keep signing up to be in this program because it feels good to be here. Um, so let's keep moving. So all of that, we I, I want to really highlight the number because I don't know if it was really emphasized, but Robin's first year here was also my first year. I was a seventh grade math teacher. And in the middle school, there's about 100 kids per grade. There was only six through eight for middle school. And then the high school similarly for we didn't even have a full high school yet. It was being built out. But within Robin's first year, there was over 200 referrals for kids that have problems. Right. And whatever those problems can be, it was wide ranging, but there's nothing we can't match a therapist with every kid that we don't have 200 therapists, even if we give every, it just was too much. And so this model was created to build into our school day. Like, how do we address this? Not after school, not making kids stay after where it also feels like a punishment, like, oh, you have to stay after school because you've got something wrong with you that we need to take care of. It was something that was built in to take care of kids during the day and also feel empowered that they're taking care of their own community. And so we're going to go through the model now of like what it looks like at our site, which again can be edited however you need it to be. Um, it's totally malle malleable for different sites, but at MPA, it's an intervention system in which high school students enroll in an internship program and experience clinical training and supervision to support a middle school student. So right now we have a... Um, UC transferable class. We've got it approved through the district. Um, we've called it different things over the years, but right now it's a career prep practicum seminar. So it's a work-based learning course that kids get a grade for, they get credits for, and it's an internship that goes on their resume. Um, and then it's a way to maximize the resiliency of a tight-knit community that can't be truly understood by outsiders. So again, I very much love this community. I've been here for multiple years, but I'm not from here and I can meet all the families. I can have the best relationships, but I still don't know what it's like to be undocumented or to learn English during sixth grade or navigate a system that wasn't built for me. And so this is a really beautiful place for our mentors who have successfully done that, really thrive and be seen as the experts of their community and their experience. And then it also empowers youth to make the positive change that they wanna see in their community. And so we really highlight a lot of times, I mean, I think it happens at least once a semester, we get a mentor who has historically been seen as someone who has given problems, right? And they come to Robin and I and they're like, are you sure this kid should be a mentor? Are you sure that, you know, they really don't act right in whatever class. And every time we say yes, because we need to give kids a chance to, you know, be the experts of their experience. And I would say 100% of the time, those kids have shown up and really done something beautiful with that um, position because they know what it's like to be a middle schooler and they know how hard it was to be themselves. And so, oh, wait, sorry, our, yeah. wait. I, I can't, you have to go back and we have to look at this picture one, one more time. I just have to interject. Dwayne, who's in the Warriors sweater, 
la um, it was in sixth grade when this picture was taken. He will be in high school next year, which is amazing. Um, he was in trouble and I was sitting next to him in the office and we were just sitting there while he was sweating, waiting to talk to the principal. And um, which I like to do that. I like to just kind of be on the bench with them when they're in trouble. I'm not really intervening. I'm just kind of going to hang out and wait while we see what's going to happen next. And he asked me, he's like, how long are you going to be here? And I was looking at the clock. It was, I think, like 2.30. And I was like, I'll probably stay. I'll probably be here till like 4.30, but likely like 5.30. He goes, no, no, no. I mean, like, really, like, how long are you staying at the school? Because I'd like to be a mentor. And he's 11, right, at the time. And I was like, oh, baby, I don't know. You know, like, that's a long time. Um, we ask that they be juniors or seniors and before they enroll. And he's like, because I get in trouble a lot, so I'm going to be really good at being a mentor. So. I just want to um, also highlight that there's a question in the chat, and you might get into this a little later, but um, what does the selection process look like for mentors? Mentors? Yeah, um, yeah go. Actually, go, B. So our mentors, like Robin said, are 11th and 12th graders. Um, really, it's self-selection. Kids, um, every year they do a course selection. Um, we have a ton of electives at our site. We actually have the most college classes also offered on our campus out of OUSD, so there's a lot of options for kids at our site. These are all kids that said they want to be mentors. We don't make anyone be a mentor. We don't force anyone to stay in mentoring. It's really an experience for them. We want, only want people that want to be here. So majority of the time it works out as long as kids have space in their schedule and they're allowed to have electives, then they are mentors. Um, and I don't think, I mean, this year has been a little rough with the pandemic, but we've never had really kids be like, I hate mentoring and I never want to be a mentor again. We usually have kids sign up for 12th grade year again um so as long as every as long as you go through the clinical training so that's what I'm going to get into is Robin has developed a six-week clinical training and they learn all the psychology racial identity neuroscience all this good stuff that is like similar to a graduate level psych course of just like child development and understanding why kids are the way that they are they learn about attachment style they learn about parts of the brain they talk about racial identity theories and so kids a lot of times not only are they learning about it to help a younger person but it's also sometimes the first time they've ever reflected on themselves like oh this is why I am the way I am oh this is why my family interacts this way or this is how it is and this is why I interact with the world like this and this is how I can help someone else um, the other component as I mentioned before is our work-based learning model so it is an internship kids do develop job skills one of the most amazing parts of that connects with the clinical training is every kid gets a file folder they do a check-in check-out form they're doing file keeping they're taking notes they're interacting with their kids and so every day um, you can see some of these kids you'll see that little green folder in their hands in this photo that's their folder and when they go meet with their kids they take their notes so at the end of the day Robin and I are looking through the notes if there's anything important most kids will stay after and let us know if there's something that's like really important that we need to know about but I don't think we've ever had anything that was like life-threatening that we've needed to address, but it is, we'll get more detailed into it, but they go through informed consent. They go through confidentiality. They know that they're going to let us know if they're in danger or anything like that, but the mentors are trained and they're really nervous at first. They're really scared because they, it's like a big deal, but by the end of it, kids say they felt prepared. There was nothing that they couldn't handle throughout the year. There was a question in the chat about would this um, model work um, with elementary and middle? And I would say yes. Um, we have worked with elementary school students. Um, we'll go into like what people are doing when they're together more, but there's also um, kind of a, a place for that to be happening. Um, we've mentioned before that the men, men, mentees for us here in this type of model are six to eight, I'm sorry, are the middle school students. So, so between sixth and eighth grade. Um, part of that in terms of need and like an evaluation and assessment was also when I got here, the high school students were actually being blamed for being bad influences on the middle school students. We were all kind of mashed up together in a very small space. We now have a new building for high school, but um, we were on top of each other. So a little bit claustrophobic essentially. And um, 
also cost referrals coming through for, for sixth graders, but our focus really was sixth grade students, the youngest people on campus, the folks that are the newest to school, they are making um, the shift um, from being um, in elementary school in the middle school. Um, so we really want to give them a lot of time and a lot of attention to be new. Um, all these boys in here have um, green kale smoothies um, in our partnership with um, the local nursery here um, and also coordination with teachers, right? So really, really developing strong relationships with all of the teachers because we're pulling kids out of class. And as many of you probably know too, like that is not always like um, something that people love is to see someone get pulled out of a math class to go play Uno or, or you know, run around the school. Um, so, I mean, we can talk a lot more later about what that looks like, but um, the benefit of this has really outweighed um, the inconvenience. And so we have a lot of buy-in now um, for this being something that we are allowed to do. And we also work with the administration to be able to schedule this. So it really flows well within the whole school day. Um, yeah, I'll keep it moving. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so that's how it's kind of functioning. And I see a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I don't want to stop yet, but Robin, if you want to stop me through them, because I can't go through them all yet. But now that's the model. That's the way in which we kind of pair. There was one question about pairing kids up. It is really intentional. Um, we do kind of interview our mentors, not in a like acceptance way, but like just getting to know the mentors and like what their skills are, what are they nervous about and everything. It's really informal. And then as we meet the sixth graders, we kind of see, what do you need? Are you really shy? Are you, you know, labeled as someone who's not doing well? And like, how can we pair people up in that way? Um, but then once they're together, I mean, this is one of our favorite pairs ever, Eris and Edward, they were spiritually the same you know, like exactly the same going through it. They were just so alike, right? And so they became a perfect pair because Eris got to be the, the guy that he never had, right? He got to be the support that he didn't have as a middle schooler. And so when they're meeting with each other, their relationship extends throughout the entire academic year. Um, they get paired around October-ish. So as we said, um, it's a six week training, which kind of varies between six to eight, depending on the school schedule and like what's going on. But the beginning is a get to know you. We have structured activities for the first like two sections of the relationship where it's a lot of surveys. We do it on like a genealogy thing. We do just esteemable qualities, all that good stuff. And then we go into mentor planned activities. And this is where more of the work-based learning stuff comes in that I'll get deeper into. but mentors actually start planning things for their mentees and then the end of the year is we have an honorable closure which is similar to clinical training of just like things end and it's okay and we love you so much but now it's time to say goodbye and maybe we'll see you again or maybe we won't but like I love you and this was really good I'm glad we had this relationship and so by the end of the year they end the relationship there, it's been very rare that this next year, sometimes we do have mentors come back and we have mentees come back. We don't normally pair them up again because needs change. And the ideal situation is that we've got Edward, for example, who came in sixth grade, who was just kind of wild and out. And then he develops confidence and also some self-regulation that maybe he needs someone who's a little bit quieter and someone who can just tone it down a little bit that he doesn't get the same mentor his need his needs will change each year and so we kind of address that too throughout the relationship lots of lots of really great questions and some of them i hope we'll get to as we move through this um so the first session there's a lot of wind up and build up um one of the examples um maybe becca uh, be, be, becca or bianca if you can just put the model in some ways is very similar to the training that is received by CASAs, right? So CASAs, court appointed special advocates go through a 40 hour training and then are sworn in. And I treat it really, really, really serious like this. I, I sort of scare them on purpose. This is the mentors, the high school students about confidentiality, about these file folders and the note keeping. Um, 
And one of the first things that they do also is they read an introduction script. And someone had a question about boundaries, which we can get into more. But what the, what the, what the script does, and I think this is really useful actually for all of us who are in clinical work, is I will come, is, is, a, is a way to be able to introduce yourself and you say, I am here to check in on you on a regular basis, learn who you are, what you like, what you need, um, celebrate with you, make goals with you, and these. this is my role, and Robin or Bianca or whomever the adult is, the, clin the clinician, will be reviewing my notes. I'm going to check in and check out, and they are, they are going to know what we talk about. And there is a confidentiality form, which is much like an informed consent that is saying that if you talk about, and this is like the mandated reporting about some way that you are a danger to yourself or someone else or someone is hurting you, I am going to let Robin know or an administrator know. And they, are, they both sign it and we go over it and then the, the, the check out form is them saying, what did they talk about? How did it go? And um, do they have anything that's of concern? Very rarely, honestly, do we have anything that's reportable that comes up in these sessions. And it's really interesting. I mean, kids are actually wanting to keep things pretty light and easy between them and occasionally they can be very like, I'm very concerned about so-and-so because they let me know that they're sleeping on, on, a, on the couch somewhere or what have you. And an adult can go in and follow up with the middle school student to be able to say, um, you know, we know that there's some things going on. Do, we, do you need any additional su support and how can we help? Um, in this initial session, they're doing an interview with each other, um, with each other these important things about me getting to know one another. Um, they're doing a genogram, they're doing a timeline activity, very much like as clinicians, the whole assessment phase, right? Like just building the rapport, getting to know one another, um, kind of understanding the rhythm, what we experience in that first initial week where they first all get to meet one another is that they are elated, they love it. And then I usually get a whole flood of middle school kids coming towards me saying, I want a mentor, I want a mentor. Um, but we definitely cover the confidentiality, the boundaries. Um, we're not necessarily encouraging people to like get with each other on Snapchat and do all this stuff. We're not saying that they can't either, but that's not like a thing of like, we need people to be talking to each other outside of school. We're really holding a frame and a context around it. And it seems and appears very hands off as if sort of, you know, we're not super involved, but like we are holding a framework for them. That is the way that we are all held within our clinical roles, right? Where it's like, I'm here to support you, but I am not your mom and I am not your sister and I'm not your girlfriend and I'm not, you know, I'm here for this. Um, so coming into the sessions with that frame um, is really, really helpful and, and useful and I think can be built around, like again, in all of your sites around what your needs and concerns are. Um, so let's, let's keep going. Yeah, so I think once they've established a relationship, kids have signed the confidentiality agreement. And I also want to say we have never had any student mentor or mentee not sign the confidentiality agreement. Actually, this year over Zoom, we had one mentor be like, he's not going to sign it. He doesn't agree with it. And we were like, oh, my gosh, the first one ever. Like, this is so interesting. Like, let's find out why. And then I go in to find out why. And he's like, I just don't understand it. And then I explained it to him and then it was fine. I was like, okay. So we've never had any kid who was like not down to sign the confidentiality agreement. But once they've gotten to know each other, like I said, we have some planned activities like timelines, you know, talking about big experiences, impactful experiences in their life, family genealogy, esteemable qualities, a lot of board games kids really love uno i really want to put this in there because they really really love uno i don't know what it is but during the school day i mean zoom class is so different now but i think it's even more apparent now like looking back to what school used to be like these kids these middle schoolers were going to six different classes per day you know 
and they're in these classes with six different adults who have varying levels of classroom management or teaching experience and they're just interacting with a lot of being told what to do um, that an uno game seems really silly to be allowing them to play during the day but it is just a chill time they're able to just like slow down a lot of our students have a lot going on at home they have siblings they're taking care of or just a lot of chaos sometimes and so it's a really calm way i mean in this picture you can see paulo and her mentor you know they're just drawing like it's just really simple things that they can interact with each other about and it's not high stakes. They're not getting graded on like how good their art project is. They're not getting graded on like how talkative they're being. It's really just like you showing up as yourself. And that's what the activities are meant to do. It's just like, we wanna to get to know you better and we wanna hold you at the center of it. And our middle schoolers kind of come out of their shells. They start to smile more, you know, they're more engaged. They, you, and this does bleed into the classroom then and teachers really see it. Um, and then also our community engagement projects, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more, but that's when our mentors start planning events for their mentees. Is this me? Sorry, I'm like just staring at it like, oh, that's cool. Um, the, so the here, uh, partly because I don't recognize it either. Here we've like Google formed up something that we were using on paper forever. Um, so the file folder um, is now virtual for us. Um, and oh, and some folks were talking about the data and the tech that we are using, but um, currently um, ending with last year, obviously, and then all of this year, this is um, a virtual form. Um, it's the checkout form where you can see with the, with the date and the time and all of that. And then um, emotional check-in um, is us really trying to also build the competency around um, the vocabulary for um, being able to talk about about feelings um, and then this is also where we're checking to see if there's issues of concern um, this is when we are meeting with the men, men, mentors again, like outside of the, the time when they're with their um, students. This is also where we are looking at this information to be able to reflect and plan and communicate needs. So Bianca will talk about the community engagement forum, but it's like for them to be thinking about what are the kids that they're working with wanting to be doing. So we are talking about like, these are the act activities but then it's also like we want to be outside we want to be outside we don't want to be in a classroom anymore so like what can we be doing to be of service in the community is it to pick up trash is it to be able to create games outside to be um to be done but this is actually a place where the mentors get graded um they need to be completing this paperwork on a regular basis much like we all need to be doing our notes and, and keeping our files in order um this is the place the framework that we are able to be able to look at what's happening and what's going on i've used the, these files going back into cost meetings and to report back to teachers and administration, students that were worried about. And I can say, well, the mentor met with them and this is what we know. And I'm not necessarily breaching confidentiality. I'm holding that pretty, pretty carefully. Um, and um, the men, men, mentoring students are have been asked to be um, in IEP me meetings, in the SSTs, meeting with parents, in other places to actually be starting to function as advocates. Um, and I, I do a training around that, around actually like functioning as in advocacy. And again, much like CASAs, right? Like to be able to be a child's voice um, but you're not speaking for yourself, you are speaking for them. So helping a kid to write a letter to a teacher. We've had folks that have advocated for their student to um, change their seating in the class and articulating why. Um, helping the middle school students to actually be more empowered to be able to say what they need, um, to be able to be successful in some other spaces besides ours. So this is the community engagement um, activities that I was referring to before. So essentially what happened as we built this out into a class, kids were actually getting a grade for it. And there was a question before about payment. We don't pay our kids to be mentors. It's part of their schedule. It's a class, they get a grade for it, they get credit and they get it on their resume. What we are doing this year because our schedule is really funky this year with Zoom World, um, 
students, the community engagement project was an additional thing they could do for a stipend. So not 100% of our mentors are doing it because the schedule is all messed up. But um, this year, we have these community engagement projects. And this is really highlighting when the youth are the experts of their own experience. So as they've been meeting with their mentee, they've been learning what their mentee needs. They're realizing that their mentee is shy. Like there's not a lot of confidence. They don't share in class. They don't like this class because they're put on the spot a lot. They don't like reading out loud or whatever it might be. This is a work-based learning component that kids develop project management skills. They plan, organize, and execute a community-based project um, that has a positive impact on their mentees and on the school community. So it's not just their mentee we're worried about. We're worried about the entire school. We want positive impacts, you know, flourishing everywhere, whether or not that you're a mentee, that you still feel the positive impacts. Um, kids have to justify, so they fill out a form, they have a whole planning sheet, and they have to justify why this would have a positive impact on their mental health. So one of our favorite stories was last year, we had two boys come to us and say, we want to do a video game tournament. And we were like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, it's already really hard to justify these kids not being in math class every week. Now you want us to bring video games to school. They're like, we're going to bring our PS4 and we're going to hook it up. We got this whole plan. And we were like, no, like that's insane. Absolutely not. But they justified why it'd be positive impacts on their mental health. And we were like, you know what? They did the assignment. They followed the expectations. It's one day. Let's just see what happens. And if it totally fails, then we can say no to it every time in the future because it totally failed. And we were so wrong. Like I admit, this is probably the most wrong I've ever been in my life, but they brought all the kids in. They really organized it. They created a whole tournament system. They had all the kids coming in. It was also Mortal Kombat. So it was also a very violent video game, which I was not prepared for either, but they were so tight knit and celebrating each other and cheering each other on. And they were like high-fiving and screaming. And like, it was the most excited I had seen kids and like working together in ever you know like I just had never seen that kind of community there was kids who never talked to each other before that were just cheering each other on there was one girl who played um and they were all like yeah get her get get him get him yeah like celebrating and I was like okay at the end of it a hundred percent of the mentees said that was like the best thing that they've ever done in their lives and they felt really connected to their community they felt like they built relationships and they felt good and that was a moment of like, yeah, we don't know what they want. We, cause we would have been like, let's plant flowers and like, let's go outside on a hike. And that's not what they wanted to do. And that is the purpose of this is that kids are leading what they think that they need, not us leading it and telling them what we think they need. It was one day it did a good thing. And we're able to give up that time a little bit to let kids lead how they think they should be led. And we're not telling them yes or no. Um, other projects include our ninth grade orientation at our school. We never had an orientation for high school. Kids literally just showed up and there was no, there was no anything. No one told them what to do. And our mentors actually said, um, I showed up to the school and no one told me where the bathroom was. Like I had to figure it out by myself. And so our mentors created an entire ninth grade orientation to deliver to eighth grade students. Um, this image here is two of our mentors from last year school closed and I said okay you guys you don't have to do the orientation this is like really difficult it's zoom I don't know how we're going to get this to happen but they were like no we just because we're on zoom they still ninth graders still need to know what's happening and they took it upon themselves to do a virtual orientation and organize and plan the whole thing um, we've done a legal dumping cleanup a mental health awareness kickball turn like all the things they plan it all and they're totally in charge of it we support it I actually have two meetings three meetings this afternoon with kids. We got some girls coming in to build art kits for their mentees. We got some girls who are doing the high school orientation. And then I got a couple of boys who are going to do a Zoom Kahoot tournament, you know, and they're really planning everything. And I'm just helping facilitate. Um, and at the end of these sessions, we survey all the mentees to ask, was this a good use of time? Did you feel more connected to your community? Do you feel better? Like all the things and 93% of mentees said that all of these projects had a positive impact on their community. So we just want to outline also how, oh yeah, jump in, jump well, in. Well, actually you're about to talk about partnership, but I just also really want to say like in terms of um, Becca's favorite word, iterative, um, Bianca, <laughs> Bianca really, this is the place, the community engagement part, like of really taking her skill set of being an educator 
and helping me to leverage that into allowing kids to really do their best work and really shine and show up for one another. Um, and so I just, again, just want to kind of, you know, she really didn't mention that, but this is really like her piece that is keeping this program really alive, right? By being the thing that kids want to be doing because they're designing it. Thank you, Becca. Sorry to interrupt you. No, I'm sorry. I did want to say one thing. When we first started community engagement projects, I was really nervous about it. And the, I sat down and said, we're going to do ninth grade orientation. You guys said, we don't have one. Let's make a ninth grade orientation. And they're like, okay, but is actually anything going to be different? because very often kids have been told things are gonna be different, but they're not different. And they were like, how are we gonna spend two months on this and nothing's gonna change? And so I see the question in chat about advocacy projects to change policy, like exactly that. Kids have been involved in conversations and then nothing changes. And so that was a really cool opportunity for me to be like, oh, I'm the adult in power and I'm gonna tell kids that things are gonna be different. And if I don't follow through, then I'm just another adult that's saying something's going to happen and it's not changing. And so this became, these projects are really a space that I say yes. To, I mean, obviously within reason, but last year, unfortunately, the pandemic, but we had planned, basically paid for, we were going to get llama support animals on campus for kids. We had two girls decide that llamas would be good for mentees because we needed animals to make people feel good. And we got that approved, we made it happen. And so we, we've done crazy things, the pandemic kind of ruined it, but this is an opportunity to really help kids gain the tools, access and opportunities to advocate for things that they want to be different. I'm sorry, Becca. Oh gosh, no, not at all. And I mean, just to, uh to join with um, this and that word iterative is, you know, the community engagement projects like Bianca saying came out of a need that was emerging. And then this year, a new, a new need emerged, which was around the, the high number of newcomer students coming in. And so Robin and Bianca worked with uh, staff at the school to have mentors become language ambassadors for some of the, the young people coming into the school for the first time. So again, just to remember that this wasn't a model that was like all set and then plopped in the school. It has evolved over time um, based on the needs emerging. And part of that has been partnerships and, and that is being exemplified even just here um, with Robin and I being staff of the uh, Alameda County um, Healthcare Services Agency, Bianca being Oakland Unified School District staff and those links um, really helping influence this, this program and provide other supports. Also, uh, Reach Ashland Youth Center, which is part of our Center for Healthy Schools and Communities. We have this picture right here was a field trip. We took the, the mentors um, on to, to expose to positive out uh, after school and summer programming. Um, we have linked with Planting Justice, which is a CBO in Sobrani Park, um, providing jobs and linking again with Bianca around workforce dollars to hire staff, uh, hire mentors at Planting Justice with Robin providing some youth development support to their staff. Teaching Tolerance, which is now called Learning for Justice, um, gave us some funding to deepen our work as well as the city of, o oh, and the mentoring curriculum is now on the uh, Learning for Justice website as a tool as well. And partnering with city of Oakland youth to youth mini grants for the community engagement. Uh, that, that was how we were gonna pay for the llamas and how we paid for um, food, et cetera. So again, just community partnerships are really important as well. Also for community buy-in. So um, we wanted to engage you all it's through the chat if you can, but part of the curriculum and the training at the beginning really focuses on reflection. And as we keep saying, you know, our mentors are the experts of this experience. Um, and a lot of times this is the first time they've really thought about it. You know, they know some things didn't work out for them or they know they've been identified as a student who needs extra support or who's getting sent to the office, who's getting referrals and everything. So. This activity is really to reflect on what they needed when they were in sixth grade. And this is an activity that's totally transferable at your own site.
who were you as a blank? Who were you as an elementary school? Who were you as a middle school? Who, all the things it might be. But we're going to take like one to two minutes because we're running out of time. But these are the questions we ask our mentors. You're more than welcome to throw it in the chat or just reflect on your own. But what's the first memory that comes to your mind for you about being in sixth grade? What do you remember about your teachers? What do you remember about your friends? Do you remember any names? What do you remember as being the most important thing for you back then? Was it your friendships? Was it playing? Was it family, your pets? What do you remember doing that was fun? Do you remember any struggles at school? Can you describe them? And what might have made your time in sixth grade better? So if you can just take a second, we'll take one minute and just think about who you were in sixth grade and what did you need in sixth grade? Who could have helped you out in sixth grade? And again, we're going to move a little bit fast just so we do leave you all some time to have some questions answered. But um, this activity that is done with the mentors, many reflections came back, and this was just a writing exercise. I collected it around um, the mentors, the high school students talking about it really being hard um, to make friends or it really being hard during lunch. Um, that lunch sometimes was the hardest period of the day to be, you know, social and um, being, um, I think Be Becca just put in, in there, but being, being, being shy and what have you. And what moved out of that um, was that um, last year um, we were able to schedule one of the classes to be during the middle school lunch period, where then mentors were creating act activities for middle school students during lunch to be able to provide some safe spaces um, for kids to make art to kids for kids to have a four square game which was like again unforeseeably like the most coolest thing in the world to be doing during lunchtime um, and um, yeah so for us to be like thinking about like what did we need what would we have wanted and using and that moment to be able to then move into like, you know, for the high school students move into their own power to make change. Yeah, I do wanna say we've had some of our mentors and actually one kid that applied for this year, he was like, I'm really shy. I don't think I'd be a good mentor because I'm still really quiet and I wouldn't be good for this. And we're like, actually we need you because you're the shy one and we're gonna pair you with a shy kid and they need to see that it's okay when you get older that you're gonna get older and you still might be shy, but you're still thriving and you can graduate and get into a four year university with a bunch of scholarships and you'll be fine. So we want all kids. There's not one type of personality that excels as a mentor. Um, thank you for sharing all of these beautiful, weird, awkward, rough experiences as a sixth grader. It's a lot and that's what we're trying to do is highlight those experiences so that our mentors have a frame of how they want to be whenever they show up. And I also want to say some of our mentors, you know, they don't make it to all their classes, but they make it to the mentoring class because this also develops an accountability that I need to show up for a kid because now I'm responsible for taking care of this little one who is not having, who could potentially not be having a good time. And I'm responsible for that person now. And so I'm going to show up and I am their person. So thank you for sharing all of those. We're going to get really quickly into data so we have time for questions and to address some things. Um, this is a picture of what Robin was just mentioning. Our mentors were like, kids are bored during lunch or they fight and slap each other or there's drama. When I was in sixth grade, there was so much drama during lunch. So they decided to create a table to have art supplies. So instead of talking smack about whoever in the bathroom, you're actually sitting out here and you can do art instead because that's way more fun and less problematic then whatever you do when you're bored, when you have nothing to do, it's not always good. So our mentors created a space where kids had something to do and they weren't getting in fights. We didn't have any fights during that lunch anymore when our mentors created something that would address that problem. So our data, we do a middle of the year and end of year survey with our mentors and our mentees. We compare this data to a similarly worded California Healthy Kids survey, which is required by the state and taken by all of our students. These are the main indicators that we're looking for, um, respect, safety, and high expectations. And so these are percentages, but um, we looked at the always responses. So 
the question was like, in this program or at the school, do you feel respected? And around over 80% of our mentees said they always feel respected, as you can see, compared to our school-wide data, which is under 25%. Similarly, do you feel safe in this program? Do you feel safe when you come to school? That's the comparison. And then do you feel like people hold you to high expectations in this program? Do you feel like people hold you to high expectations at school? It's a little bit higher for the school, but we still see it's like nearly 80% that our mentees are really feeling loved and seen, which is our goal. We want them to feel seen, heard, and respected. I, I recently read a statistic um, from Zach Norris's We Keep a Safe book that over 50% of kids don't hear their name heard in a school day. Nobody calls them out by their name to say hello or makes eye contact with them. And as Robin mentioned before, that is our goal. And that's what our data is showing that kids are feeling loved, seen, safe, heard, and to held high expectations because we know the higher the expectations that kids can meet it. And so these are some quick little, I'll just pull out a couple of what mentees say about this program. They love it because they get to talk to someone who's older. They give good advice, good perspectives. They wanna to talk to someone that's not an adult, it's a young person. So again, it's not their friend and it's not an adult because we're annoying and we think we know everything, but there's someone in the middle who, who's been through it, who knows. They can always talk to a person um, when they have a problem and their mentor is nice and she takes care of me. And um, Becca, if you wanna share super quick about your newcomer interview experience. Absolutely. Um, yes, when I was uh, supporting one of the, um, the, the surveys with a Spanish speaking uh, student who had just, just come here, uh, she was saying that being able to be connected to a mentor was basically what helped her navigate and get through things and feel connected to someone and answer her questions around how to navigate both the school and, you know, living in a different country. And again, these are the types of things that we highlight for the mentor's experience. These are things that basically go onto their resume. They develop their listening skills, emotional intelligence, moral development, observation of child development, communication skills, coping skills, strategies to support and comfort, understanding of differentiation, understanding of compassion, professionalism, community development strategies, and care for others. This was a, um, a little bit of a um, re-articulated um, list that was given to us by um, the high school students. So when we were turning these bullet points into what actually gets put into their resume that they'd make with us at the end of the year, we were really turning these into these action words that is really showing their frame. Um, Fernando graduated two years ago um, and went to um, the Board of Supervisors office um, got an invitation like specifically to go work with them around um, doing some project based um, community cleanup initiatives based on some things that he was interested in um, and really like stepped in really a lot into his power. Um, in our program, in the mentoring program. We really gave him a lot of space to be able to say what he felt was important. And, and he went on besides working with his student um, to be doing some more work in the community. So the mentor's experience is also really, um, really a, a growth and development um, space for them as well. Yeah, he's actually the one who asked me, is anything going to be different if I give you all this advice? So he's the one who did that. <laughs> and now he's making sure that it is, so that other people are mm -hmm. taking his advice. He's, yeah. So we're going to go through very quickly some tools and resources, and this is pretty much the culmination of everything that we have to offer you based on everything that we just said. But we do have a curriculum that Becca has been putting into the chat. Um, this was um, developed in partnership with Center for Healthy Schools and Communities. Um, Robin and I also have developed our own nonprofit outside of our work with the school and with the center in which we offer consulting services for this kind of work if you'd wanna start this at your site. If you have questions that you wanna directly contact us about, these are our emails that we can post into the chat as well. And then lastly, like I said, our nonprofit is a nonprofit. And so we do collect donations because all these things like this beautiful hoodie we have here are all things that come out of our pockets so that we create beautiful things for the program. So kids have feel also like they're doing good and they're being 
rewarded and recognized for it. So do you want to say anything else, Robin? Um, our current focus to, is is um, workforce development in terms of the nonprofit work. Um, just wanting to, I mean, especially after the pan pandemic and um, the pandemic that we were experiencing here in East Oakland of um, homicides and shootings and wanting to make sure that we are um, to the best of our ability coming up with spaces and places for kids to be working, getting some money in their pocket, being safe in the meantime. So this continues to grow and develop as we as we are moving it forward. Hi, Jessica, what's happening? Are we ready to close out? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, we have one minute, so I just wanted to ask a few questions. Um, and I think this got asked, answered in some chatting, but just for everyone, uh, people are wondering how much um, staffing time this takes. In this, at the school site, um, it, it for years has mainly just been me and it's a lot of coordination um, and planning. So that is kind of what like cons consulting around that would, would, would look like. So FTE, it's, you know, pretty much like a halftime job um, full on. There's also the classroom teaching piece. Um, Bianca and I have tag team this like through the years and also um, asked for additional resources for the school. Um, so I would say like a one third time teacher, um, like classroom teacher. Um, and again, I mean, I think like kind of like chopping up what different bits of it because there's a lot of back office work that happens. And then um, if you have a strong cost team, then that also helps, right? To like be doing the referrals and making sure that people are the right fit and all of that. And Bianca, what else would, would you say about time? Yeah, I think starting out it's a lot of groundwork in the beginning to establish culture as well. I think that was a really, I was teaching when Robin was starting this and I was, I was also skeptical. This kid's failing math and you want to pull them out of my class. That was hard, but then you also need to develop that awareness of the kids failing math, them being stuck in your class, not having any food or being seen or heard individually is not going to help them pass math. They need to leave to get a little bit of that love. And then they come back and then that kid's way more chill to be around and is not acting out or seeing the things that teachers are writing these referrals for. So it is a culture shift if you're out of school, but there are just some barriers that take some time. But as you go now, I mean, we have mentors all over. They're wearing the hoodies. It's like a cool thing. I just told a teacher, hey, the mentors need to log in at 12. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. She's like, cool, totally. I'll set them up. Great. Everything's fine. You know, they're totally about it now. Whereas before... We kind of had to ease into it. So I think the beginning takes a little bit of time, but people warm up to it once they see the impact. Well, I just want to thank you guys so much for your time. We're um, after one, this was so wonderful. Um, and just to reiterate to everyone out there that if you have any questions, if you want ongoing support, reach out. We can set this up, make this happen. Um, we're really excited about supporting you guys um, implementing this. And like Robin and Bianca and Becca have all said, it's really tailorable to your unique community. And so there were a lot of questions about how often they meet, um, how much time is required. And I think that's something that can really be tailored to your individual communities and what's possible. So just wanna thank you guys. And this was really wonderful. Thank you for having us. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to meet some of you soon. Thank you.